John McElroy here, talking all things automotive. You know, unbelievably, the auto industry is actually shrinking, or at least in mature markets like North America, Western Europe, and Japan, it is. Incredibly, vehicle sales in those markets are lower than they were 10 years ago. And the revenue of the six largest legacy OEMs, when adjusted for inflation, have barely budged at all, or even shrunk. This will likely set the stage for a market share war the likes of which this industry has never seen. A decade ago, the future. Well, there's no doubt that what he's saying is true. Hi, this is Randy Kirk. I wanted to bring you this video. I think that this is just amazing. I think the way that he's described it uh, is going to be very, very helpful for you to understand, for me to understand what's coming uh, with regard to the automotive industry. I think it's going to happen a lot faster probably than John does, but I think it's uh, it's instructive anyway. So let's uh, let's uh, check it out. I'll be interrupting him from time to time because you might be surprised, but I'll have some thoughts on what he has to say. Sure look brighter. In 2010, industry forecasters predicted that global sales would top 100 million new vehicles a year by 2020. They thought that sales would top 20 million a year in the U.S. by 2020. But it never happened. Global sales peaked at 92 million vehicles in 2019, and U.S. sales peaked at about 17 million. The COVID pandemic and chip shortage chopped global sales down to 89.3 million in 2023, and U.S. sales to 15.5 million. And while sales will likely recover to their 2019 levels, the mature markets will probably never go much higher over that again. By the way, check out my report on Peak Auto as to why millions of households have dropped out of the new car market. I came to all these conclusions. I'd be, I'd be interested to go ahead and take a look at that one as well to find out why so many people are dropping out of the market. But I think that you and I both know a bunch of them. And these are things that people just don't take into consideration, although I think possibly John does. But for instance, you've got just the regular demographics, just the real demographics of the United States in terms of, yes, we're growing in population, but the population of young people is not where the growth is taking place. We've got a lot of people coming in uh, that are, uh, the, we're getting older and older, people that are less inclined to drive. A big one, of course, and I think he will mention this later, is we're driving the cars longer. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't know about you, we thought a car was completely done, you know, take it down to the uh, junkyard at about 90,000, maybe 100,000 miles. Uh, and you got rid of it for a hundred bucks. I mean, literally a hundred bucks. I did a lot of that when I was that age. And uh, now a car at a hundred thousand is no big deal. It's you're gonna it's gonna drive great for another 60, 70, 80,000 miles. So that's a, a big change that that we're seeing. After going through the sales, revenue, and stock prices of Toyota, Volkswagen, Hyundai Motors, General Motors, Ford, and Honda over the last 10 years. And the numbers really tell a story. I would have loved to include Stellantis in this group, but Stellantis didn't exist a decade ago. Let's start with Toyota, since it's the biggest car company in the world. From 2014 to 2023, its global sales increased by 1 million units to 11.2 million vehicles, a decade-long growth rate of 9.8%. That's less than 1% a year. Its revenues grew by 44.6%. To 37 trillion yen. But over that time period, the yen devalued against the dollar by 42%. And since about 75% of Toyota sales are outside of Japan, its increase in revenue has a lot to do with the weakening of the yen. This chart, which shows 2014 on the left, shows Toyota's revenue growth in yen with the blue line and the orange line shows the same revenue, but in dollars. So basically, the Toyota story, as you'll see as this, as this video develops, is probably the best of the stories. They've grown. They've grown in units. Not very much, but they've grown in units. They've grown in actual dollars. They've grown even more than that in yen. They've grown quite nicely in profits as well. Um, and so right now, Toyota's king of the heat. And for good reason, they've done a great job. Don't know how that looks as we uh, take our telescope and look a few years out, but uh, and and he won't really get into that. But I think if they don't get into BEV soon, their story is going to change rapidly. And the right hand side of the chart shows 
the big ramp up in the yen as it devalued against the dollar. As of right now, Toyota stock is trading 177% higher than it did in 2014, which is a great return for shareholders and is the best performance of this group of legacy automakers. Volkswagen is the second largest automaker in the world. From 2014 to 2023, its global sales fell by 900,000 units down to 9.2 million. Its revenues grew from 202 billion euros to 279 billion, up 37.9% or less than 4% a year on average. This chart from 2014 to 2022 shows Volkswagen's revenue in nominal euros with the blue line, while the orange line shows the revenue adjusted for inflation. As you can see, the company hasn't grown that much. Adjusted for inflation, VW's revenues are up 8% over the decade, but that's only 0.8% a year on average. Clearly, investors don't like what they're seeing. VW AG's stock price is down 63 euros a share, or 31% compared to a decade ago. So Volkswagen, of course, famously has all kinds of problems. We know those problems. If you listen, if you've been paying any attention at all, it's it's got uh, problems with the unions. It's got problems with the family. It's got problems with making decisions about who's going to be in leadership. It's got problems with thinking that they could do things that they just absolutely couldn't do in terms of software. Uh, it's got problems on uh, product selection. It's got problems in terms of lying to the public about their uh, their diesel engines. I mean, they got their list of problems is 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 epic. Uh, they're still the second largest car company, but there's nothing to make us believe that they are going to be one of the big winners uh, over the next several years, unless they figure it out really, really soon. The Hyundai Group, which includes Kia and Genesis, sold 7.8 million vehicles in 2014, but only 7.2 million in 2023. So it's slightly smaller than it was a decade ago. But thanks to moving its brands upscale, revenue grew by 73%, the highest by far amongst these automakers. As the chart shows, even when adjusted for inflation, Hyundai was able to grow its revenue significantly in the last three years. And while Hyundai stock is only up 7%, Kia stock, which is traded separately, is up 116%, and it's on a tear right now. If you, if you listen to this particular channel, you know that I believe Hyundai Kia as a group will end up being one of the one of the big winners in this uh, in this next four or five, six years. Uh, they seem to be making some very, very good decisions with regard to product selection. They are definitely making big moves with regard to BEVs. Uh, their products seem to be uh, good quality uh, and well-priced. I see them as being a winner. And so far, everything that we're seeing uh, is, is indicating that. Honda, though, also had a tough decade. Last year, it sold 11% fewer cars than it did in 2014. Its revenue was up 35% in that time. But as already pointed out, the weakening of the yen helped inflate that revenue number. Honda stock is up 30%, a growth rate of about 3% a year on average. Not great, but it's better than putting the money in a bank account. General Motors has shrunk the most of any automaker, mainly because it abandoned so many global markets notably Europe. In 2014, General Motors sold 9.9 .9 million vehicles. Last year, that dropped to 6.1 million, down 38%, even though it sold. Mary led, <laughs> and it mattered. Can you imagine that horrible drop in total sales, and she's still at the helm? Are fewer vehicles, though. GM's annual revenue is $16 billion higher than it was a decade ago, yet adjusted for inflation. It should have been $30 billion more, just to match what it brought in a decade ago. As this chart shows, from 2014 to 2023, GM's nominal revenue in blue has gone up, but on an inflation-adjusted basis in orange, it's actually lower than it was in 2014. And this helps explain why its stock price has gone nowhere. The price is exactly where it was in 2014. And for
And of course, we've watched as the as the leadership at uh, General Motors has made mistake after mistake after mistake in terms of purchasing other companies, in terms of the products that they've uh, provided that they've come out with in the BEV space, uh, in terms of their pricing, in terms of their batteries. I mean, just pretty much a complete mess. It's it's just hard to imagine uh, why there hasn't been a change at the top in this company. A similar story. With global sales of only 4.4 million vehicles, it's now selling 30% fewer cars, trucks, and vans than it did 10 years ago. And while its 2023 revenue of $176 billion is up 20%, it should have been up another $13.7 billion just to keep pace with inflation. Just like General Motors, on an inflation-adjusted basis, Ford brought in less revenue in 2023 than it did in 2014. This is a key reason why Ford stock is trading nearly 27% lower than it did in 2014. So everybody seems to like, uh, you know, the leadership at Ford and, and, and he's very likable. I'm forgetting Jim Farley. He's a likable guy and he seems smart. Um, but, you know, his performance is no better than General Motors. Um, and there's really nothing happening at Ford that would make me feel like they're going to get it right anytime soon. Many people have suggested that he just needs to follow the decision that he made with regard to chargers and look to Tesla to help him produce some cars that would be good values, that would be compelling products, compelling cars at a compelling price. But so far, Jim hasn't made that move. What these numbers show is that the major automakers here are stuck in a rut. Yeah, some like Toyota and the Hyundai Group are doing better than the others, but it's all relative. They're really not doing all that great. So here's what the industry is going to have to do. First, if automakers want to grow, they've got to be in the growing markets like Africa, Southeast Asia, India, and South America. Second. I think he's right about some of that, Southeast Asia and India. Uh yeah, you 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 want to have a global footprint, but we have to take into consideration the kind of numbers that we're talking about here. China is far and away the largest market. The United States, the second largest mar market by a lot. Uh, Japan and Europe, uh, you know, make up another huge percentage. You add in Canada and some of the southeast yeah, Southeast Asian countries. I mean, South Korea, et cetera, Australia, and you're getting a big percentage of the overall to total business. So I'm not sure that his wisdom is so great here with regard to moving into these other markets, at least unless you already have great penetration in the markets where you can sell a higher price car, which is likely to have higher margins, and he will address that. Automakers don't want to go into those developing markets, and they may not want to because they tend to be very low profit margin markets. Then they need to figure out ways to drastically cut car prices to entice more buyers back in the mature markets. But they have to cut prices without sacrificing profit margins, which means they need to be very clever in how they cut costs, like using Tesla's unboxed assembly process or things along those lines. So it's very nice of them for a shout out to Tesla on their unbox process. But why in the world would he start there? Why wouldn't he start with like switching to battery electric vehicles, which are obviously going to be a lower price over time? Why wouldn't he talk about the things that Tesla's already done in terms of lowering prices, uh, like using Giga Castings? I mean, uh, yeah, a great call out. And he seems to be a Tesla fan. But boy, uh, the analysis here is a little thin. Third, and they are trying to do this one. They need to come up with new sources of revenue. This is why automakers are trying to sell subscriptions to services like Tesla's full self-driving, GM Super Cruise, or Ford's Blue Cruise. But it's going to take time to move into new markets, to slash manufacturing costs, or dream up services that customers will want to subscribe to. In the meantime, since the major markets are not growing, they're going to have to fight tooth and nail to hold on to the customers that they've already got. Because if you lose customers, you lose sales volume. If you lose sales volume, you lose manufacturing scale. If you lose manufacturing scale, your profit margins fall. And if your profit margins fall, it's only a matter of time before you go out of business. <laughs> so that, that's a really good place to stop. Um, this, of course, is something that we've been talking about for a very long time in terms of 
of the collapse of these legacy automobile companies if they don't get the products right. And they've got very little time left. Uh, I've said uh, on many different occasions that I believe that we're looking at 2027, 2028, when it's really going to be substantially making the switch over to battery electric vehicles, that's only three to four years away. And a lot of these companies aren't even close to putting together the packages that they need to have in terms of the electric vehicles. They, and it takes them two to three years just to ramp up. They're way, way behind the eight ball. Uh, Toyota in particular, Honda, these companies are really, really looking and a, a serious problem, as, especially as the Chinese ramp up, as Tesla is continuing to ramp all over the world with their factories and more factories, I'm quite sure, on the way. But again, you get this squeeze taking place where if they sell fewer vehicles, you know, you're looking at Ford and General Motors selling 33% fewer vehicles. You're looking at, at uh, Volkswagen selling 20% fewer vehicles. Already, this is causing their overhead to become a higher percentage of, of, their, of their sales. It's already causing the cost that they're going to pay for raw materials and parts from other third-party suppliers. All of those things go up, which, re, which gives them less flexibility in terms of lowering their price. With Tesla having a big, big margin already, even after all their cuts, they still have industry-leading margins. Tesla sits in the catbird seat along with the Chinese makers and, in my opinion, the South Koreans. Anyway, I thought you'd find that interesting. I hope you did. Uh, please hit like, hit, please hit subscribe, hit notify. You want to be notified about tonight's program where we're going to be talking about what do we always talk about on Sunday night. The program is called Monday Morning. We're talking about what's going to happen in the markets next week. We got the PCE hitting this week, so you know you're going to want to hear what if people think what is going to happen when the PCE numbers come out on Thursday. And uh, yeah, and then also uh, yesterday I did a video uh, le yesterday uh, uh, afternoon uh, that you're going to want to go back and take a look at. I'm forgetting what the heck it was about, but it was really good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know what it was. In fact, a lot of people said it was one of the best videos I've ever done. If you didn't see it, I'm just going to say you should go back and take a look. I took a look at the 15 aspects of who Elon Musk is that make him who he is, the superpowers. And they're su they are superpowers. These are not places where he's a little bit better than somebody else. These are places where he is a master. He's at the top of the list in terms of capabilities in some of these areas. Suggest maybe one of them might be leadership. Maybe, I don't know. How do you know a good leader? Oh, there's people following him. <laughs> so maybe, maybe he's a good leader. I'm not sure. Anyway, check out that video. I'll put the card right here. Please join Patreon. Please buy some Cybertruck uh, bottle openers. That's all I got for you right now. It's been great talking to you.